Well, we are in a series called Q&A, and if you don't know, it stands for Questions and Answers. Many of you submitted questions that you had about the Bible that you wanted to hear a sermon about. Uh, It says, your questions, God's answers, which is very presumptuous, but I'm going to do my best. So our question today, uh, the first two sermons, by the way, if you missed them, they're online at our website. You can go and watch them there. Uh, But the question that we're dealing with today is, how can I be sure that I'm saved? Why is that question important? Well, there's a couple of reasons, but a big one is that we have an enemy. Those of us who are believers, we have an enemy who wants to, who wants us to doubt whether God can really love us at all. I heard somebody say that, that the devil wants to convince believers that they're not going to heaven. And he wants to convince unbelievers that they are going to heaven. He just wants to confuse us and discourage us. But even without an enemy trying to sow doubt in our minds, we do a pretty good job of that all by, our, by ourselves, don't we? I mean, if you're, if you've been a believer for any amount of time at all, you doubt. Because what happens? We sin and sometimes we feel close to God and sometimes we feel far from God and, and it's all about our feelings, right? And, and sometimes we're doing great in our walk with God and sometimes we've sinned and we've done awful things and we just think, how can God, how can God even love me? If I was really a Christian, I wouldn't do those things. Have you ever had those thoughts? It's okay to be honest. So, is it possible to know for sure whether I'm saved? Is it even possible? Well, good news, yes, it is possible. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So the first thing that we really need to to know is what is salvation? What does that even mean to say that someone is saved? Well, salvation, if you didn't know, by the way, we all sin. We all do things that God doesn't want us to do. We act ways God doesn't want us to act. We say things God doesn't want us to say. There's God's standard and then there's what we actually do. And it always falls short. So we have a broken relationship with God. And because we sin, we're condemned. There has to be a penalty for our sin. So salvation is that Salvation means that God himself provided a way for us to have forgiveness of sin and restored relationship with him. Well, what is that way? That way is Jesus. And it's only Jesus. And there's no other way. Jesus is God come to earth as a man living a perfect life, perfect sinless life. And then he went to the cross and was crucified, killed there, and shed his blood in our place for our sin. The Bible says that without the shedding of blood, there can be no forgiveness of sin. So somebody had to die for our sin. And Jesus is the only one who could pay that penalty for the whole world because he lived a perfect life. And the Bible tells us that God showed that his gift was accepted because he raised him from the dead on the third day. So in John 14, 6, Jesus had been talking to his disciples. He'd been telling them about heaven. And he was, and he told them, I'm gonna, in my father's house are many rooms. I'm going there to prepare, to prepare a place for you. And one of his disciples, Thomas, said, God, or Jesus, we don't know the way. And so in verse six, Jesus said to them, to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. No one 
comes to the Father except through me. Well, what about people in other religions? No one comes to the Father except through me. Well, what about people who don't like that option? No one comes to the Father except through me. Well, why is there only one way? I would ask, why is there any way to God? God was not obligated to provide any way for us to have restored relationship with him. And I thought of this analogy. It's probably an imperfect analogy, but I'm going to say it anyway. Imagine you have kids. Some of you won't have to imagine very hard. Imagine you have kids. And let's say that, you know, you have rules in your house and you have expectations of how you want your kids to act and behave. And let's say your kids are just being awful. I know it's a stretch. Just imagine. Imagine your kids are just being awful. They're they're not only not doing what you told them to do, they're openly defying you. I'm not going to do that. And on top of it, they're being disrespectful. And they're fighting with each other. I know this is a stretch, but just stay with me. They're just doing, they're just awful. And they're, they're just, and let's say, let's say that you have a trip to Disneyland on the calendar. And finally you've had enough and you say, you know what? Trip canceled. We're not going to Disneyland. And of course they scream and protest and cry. And so you say, you know what? Okay, if you do this one thing, we'll go to Disneyland. Just go and clean your room. If you go clean your room, then you can go to Disneyland. I don't want to clean my room. Well, if you want to go to Disneyland, go clean your room. Well, can't I, can't I rake the yard? No. Clean your room. Disneyland. Isn't there another way? There's no other way. This is the way. It's not a perfect analogy, but it helps kind of paint a picture. Who are the kids to get to protest and say, well, I don't like that way. Well, it's the way, okay? So accept it, don't accept it, I don't care. It's the way. God is saying to us, this is the way to have forgiveness of sin and restored relationship with me. It's through Jesus' sacrifice on the cross and his atonement for your sin. And uh, Jim preached a message recently. I don't even remember what it was about. <laughs> but he said something that made me, just kind of made something click differently for me when he was talking about sin. He said that all sin, all sin is already paid for. Jesus paid for it all, right, on the cross. It's already paid for. So the forgiveness of sin is already out there, and people just have to go receive it. The Bible talks about our sin as being, one picture it paints is is our sin is filthy rags. Imagine you're just wearing filthy rags. And imagine Jesus is wearing this perfectly white robe of righteousness, And he invites you to come to him and take off your filthy rags and give them to him and he will give you his perfect robe of righteousness. So people are walking around in their filthy rags and that perfectly white robe of righteousness is just out there available. You just have to receive it. In Matthew 22, chapter 22, Jesus told a parable He said, the kingdom of God is like a king who was giving a wedding feast. And he sent us, the king sent his servants out and said, invite everybody to this wedding feast. And everybody came, well, a lot of people came. But it says there was one guy who, who wasn't wearing a wedding garment. And the king said to him, why, why are you not wearing a wedding garment? And he kicked him out of the feast. And the point is that we can't go to heaven unless we accept Jesus' 
wedding garment, his perfect robe of righteousness. One of the last things that Jesus said on the cross before he died is, it is finished. He said, it is finished. Well, what was finished? What was finished was the work of salvation. All that needed to be done for forgiveness of sin was finished right there on the cross. Nothing to be added to it. Nothing to supplement it. Nothing it needed. It was finished. In Ephesians 2, verses 1-5 through talks about it this way. Talking about us. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. That's all bad news. Here's the good news. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. What can a dead person do? Nothing. You can go to a dead person and say, get up. If they do get up, run. But they won't get up. A dead person can do nothing. We were dead in our sin, in our trespasses. The only one who could act to fix that was God. Even when we were dead in our trespasses, God made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. Romans 3, verses 23 through 25 says this, For all have sinned, all have sinned, and fall short of the glory of God, and are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by His blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. Who does the work? It's, it's all God. We all sinned. We all fell short. And God acted to forgive our sin or to provide a way for our sin to be forgiven. In Hebrews 10, verses 11 through 13, talks about it like this. And it's talking about the Jewish priests who would offer the sacrifices in the temple. It says, And every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God waiting from that time until his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet. He sat down because the work was finished. The one sacrifice that was required for all time, a single sacrifice for sins. So that's what salvation is. So it's important to examine, if you doubt your salvation, it's important to examine why you're doubting your salvation. What are some reasons why you might doubt your salvation? Well, one reason might be, maybe you have unrepentant, persistent sin in your life. And if you do, it needs to be dealt with. And God's not going to let you feel okay with that sin. If you're a believer and and you're disobedient and you're having this sin that you know God has told you you need to stop or deal with it. If you refuse to do that, God's not going to let you feel okay with that. So maybe there's a good reason for your doubt that it's not that you're not saved, but you have something that needs to be dealt with. Another reason might be 
if you're a believer, you have the Holy Spirit. You have the Spirit of God living in you. And when you have that, the Holy Spirit gives you a new sensitivity to sin that you didn't have before. And that's a good thing. Believe it or not. It's a good thing to have a sensitivity to sin so that you're bothered by sin. That's an evidence that you have the Holy Spirit in you. Unbelievers are not bothered by a lot of sin, in case you didn't know. Another reason why you might doubt your salvation is you might be comparing yourself with a believer who's more mature than you. If you're a brand new believer and you look at somebody who's been a believer for a long time, you can compare and be like, oh man, I'm nowhere near as good as them and faithful as them. It's good to look at other more mature believers as an example, but you can't let it make you think that you're just not a Christian because you're not like them. You, if you're a child, you don't compare a child to an adult as far as growth. Another reason you might doubt your salvation is you might be because of spiritual immaturity. Maybe you just don't know what the Bible says. And so you don't understand. Another reason, you might be like me, and maybe you grew up in the church. And you just don't know anything else. My dad's a pastor. I've been going to church since probably right after I was born. And, you know, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, Tuesday night, we're always at church, and it's the only thing that I know. Other people, this might be you, come to uh, salvation later in life, and there's a definite before and after, right? I used to be this way. I'm not that way anymore. Now I'm like this. If you grew up in the church, it's like I've always been like this. I, do, I don't really have a before and after, uh, so am I really saved? So that might describe you. So how can I be sure that I'm saved, that I'm still saved? If I'm doubting, how can I be sure? Well, we sometimes look in the wrong places for assurance. We might look uh, whether think whether God's doing anything in our lives. We might look at our spiritual growth. We might look at our good works and obedience to God's word. You know, are those things happening? And if they're not, am I even saved? Those things... Things God is doing in our lives, spiritual growth, good works, obedience, those things are evidence of our salvation. That's not what we should base the assurance of our salvation on. You do want to be seeing those things in your life. You want to see growth in your life. But that's not why you're saved. That's not the assurance. You don't place your assurance in those things. Here's what we need to find our assurance, where we need to find our assurance. We need to find our assurance of our salvation on the objective truth of God's word. It needs to be based on the promises that God has declared, not our subjective experiences, and definitely not on our feelings. Here's a popular phrase that you've heard, trust your heart. Don't ever trust your heart. The Bible says his heart is deceitfully wicked. Don't trust your heart. Like Obi-Wan Kenobi to Luke Skywalker, trust your feelings. Don't trust your feelings. For those of you who are, who are married or who have been married, did do you always feel married? If I don't feel married, does that make me not married? No, don't trust your... There, there will be times where you feel like you're not saved. Don't trust your feelings. So here's the good news. God wants us to be assured of our salvation. He didn't give us all of his promises in the Bible so that we would, so that he would keep us guessing. Okay? So he, we're going to talk about some of the promises in the Bible that, that can assure us that if we're his, we're his. First John 5, verses 11 through 13 says this, and this is the testimony that God gave us eternal life. And this life is in his son. Whoever has the son has a life. Whoever does not have the son of God does not have life. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the son of God that you may know 
that you have eternal life, that you may know that you have eternal life. So how may you know? Those of you who believe in the name of the Son of God. So do you believe in Jesus? Do you believe in him, that he is God's Son, that he is the the uh, the means by which your sins can be forgiven? Do you believe in Jesus? If you believe in Jesus as the Lord of your life, then you can know that you have eternal life. Here's another one, John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Here's the important part, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. So do you trust Jesus alone for salvation? Here's another one, John 10, 28 and 29. I give them eternal life and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. Who can snatch you out of his hand? No one. Here's more promises. Philippians 1.6, And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. God is the one who works in you. He is the one who starts the work and who completes the work. 1 Corinthians 1, 4 through 9. I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that was given you in Christ Jesus, that in every way you were enriched in him in all speech and all knowledge, even as the testimony about Christ was confirmed among you, so that you were not lacking in any gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will sustain you to the end, guiltless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Who will sustain you to the end? Jesus. It doesn't say you need to sustain yourself, you need to keep yourself. It says he will sustain you to the end. 1 Thessalonians 5.23 Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. God keeps you. 1 Peter 1.3-5 Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. You have an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading. And where is it kept? It's kept in heaven for you. By who? By God. And it says it's God's power. Romans 8, verses 30 through 39. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died, more than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us all, who is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. 
No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. You cannot be separated from God's love. None of those things. So what's the point of all the promises if we can't know for sure? God intends for us to take heart from all those promises and all the other promises that I didn't mention. So here's some questions to ask yourself when you think about your own salvation. Do you believe in the gospel? And again, don't confuse faith with your feelings. Like I said, uh, what, why, if I don't feel like I'm married, am I still married? Yes, because I entered into a covenant relationship with my wife. God entered into a covenant relationship with us that isn't dependent on how we feel. John 5.24 says, uh, Jesus says, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. It's all about hearing Jesus' word and believing in him. Here's another question. Is the Spirit moving in your life? Is the Spirit leading you, convicting you of sin? Is He reminding you, comforting you, empowering you, producing fruit? What does that mean, producing fruit? Well, Galatians 5, 22 and 23 tells us that the fruit of the Spirit, if you have the Spirit in you, the fruit that He will produce in you is love, joy, peace, patience, Kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Well, that's if you're like me, that's a discouraging list. Because I read that, I'm like, I'm not always loving or joyful or peaceful or patient or kind or good or faithful or gentle or having self-control. Well, what you need to know is that none of us is ever going to do any of those things perfectly, right? But can you look back on yourself however many number of years? For, for me, I always think about when I was 20, 30 plus years ago. And then I don't, I don't think about it too long because it's, <laughs> it's embarrassing. But are you more loving than you used to be? Are you more joyful than you used to be? Are you more peaceful? Are you more patient? Are you more kind? Are you more gooder? Are you more faithful? Are you more gentle? Do you have more self-control? Yes, I, I can say that, <laughs> while not perfect, just ask my wife, uh, I'm better at all those things than I used to be. So is, is, that's an evidence that you're saved. That's an evidence that the Holy Spirit is working in you and producing fruit. Here's another question to ask yourself. Do you desire to live a godly life? To obey and serve God? I'll tell you, unbelievers don't have that desire. So if you have that desire, even if you know you're not doing it perfectly, if you have that desire, you know that you have the Spirit of God. Because again, without God, we're dead. We're spiritually dead, and we don't have that desire. So take comfort if you if you can say, yes, I, I, even though I don't do it well, I desire to live a godly life. That's evidence that God is working in you. Here's another question to ask yourself. What do you love? What are the things that you love? Because the Bible tells us when we're saved, God makes us into new creatures. We're a new creation. We have new affections that we didn't have before. Do you love the Lord? Do you love his word? Do you love God's people? Do you like? Do you love coming to church and worshiping with God's people? Those are evidences that you have God's Spirit in you? Is there a humility in my life? What do I mean by that? Well, the thing about sin and having an awareness of sin is that tends to keep us humble because we realize that we're not perfect and we realize that we have a long way to go. 
uh, that we're aware of our sinfulness. But here's an encouraging verse. Because again, you have the Spirit, you have a new awareness of sin, and it can be discouraging. But an encouraging verse is 1 John 2, 1 and 2, that says, My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the world. What does propitiation mean? Propitiation means averting the wrath of God by the offering of a gift. God is loving, yes, and merciful, yes, and gracious, yes, but he's also just. And he can't just ignore sin. And so all of us sinning all the time builds up God's wrath against our sin. And Jesus put himself on the cross and took all of that wrath in our place. And then it says that he's daily advocating for you and me. And when we sin, we have an advocate with the Father saying, I paid the, I paid the penalty for that sin. Here's another question to ask yourself. Am I obedient to God? <laughs> and if you're honest, like me, you'll say, well, no. But think about obedience this way. Think about obedience as a direction, not perfection. Think about it as a trajectory, a longing to obey the Lord. Am I, am I in a direction where I'm wanting to obey God as opposed to disobeying and going the other way from what God wants for me? Because none of us, if you didn't know it, none of us are ever going to perfectly obey God. But do you have that desire? And the obedience, again, it's not to earn salvation, but it's out of love for God. You know, I love my wife, so I want to do things that please her. I love my parents, so I want to do things that please them. I love God, so I want to do things that please Him. Here's here's another question. Does your faith stay intact through trials? If you haven't been through any trials yet, you will. And what happens to your faith in the trial and, and on the other side of the trial? Does it draw you to God? Is your faith still intact? Or does it drive you away from God? Faith that comes from above can withstand trials. So if you've been through a trial, a hard time, suffering, and you still have your faith, that's an evidence that you have God's Spirit in you. James 1, verses 2 to 3 says, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. Well, why would I do that? Why would I count trials as joy? Well, because of this. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. God uses trials in our life to strengthen our faith as we come through them. So if you do find yourself doubting whether you're saved or not, what do you do? What do you do if you're doubting? Well, first, make sure that you're clear on the, on the gospel of Jesus. What does the Bible actually say about Jesus' work of salvation? Familiarize yourself with that. It's by grace alone, through faith alone. It's not of works. So study the word. Because again, God, does, God doesn't leave us to guess at these things. He's told us. Study the letter of 1 John. The Apostle John, he wrote three letters, and if they're near the end of your Bible. If you go to the last book of the Bible, Revelation, and hang a left a few books, you'll find 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. The, the, The book of 1st John is a letter that he wrote to some believers. The entire book was written so that they could know that they were saved. So study 1st John. 
Here's another thing you can do. Practice spiritual disciplines. Meditate on Scripture. Participate in the church body. Meeting with and worshiping with other believers. Cultivate a life of prayer. If you're married, you know this. If you want a relationship with to grow, you have to pursue and cultivate it, don't you? Can you get can you get married and then just ignore your spouse and expect good things to happen? No, you work on it, right? What more important relationship could we have than our relationship with God? There's things we can do to strengthen our relationship and grow our relationship. Are you, are you frequently in God's word? God has revealed himself to us in his word. We have more access to God's word than at any time in human history. My wife was organizing our house this past week and we had gotten some uh, boxes out of storage and she's going through books and we moved a certain bookcase to a different spot and she's like, how many Bibles do we have? Plus, not to mention, you're just on your phone. You get a free Bible app. There's no excuse for us not to be in God's Word. You just got to make time. Make it a habit. And pray. The Bible says to pray without ceasing. Well, how do you do that? Well, just constantly be throwing up prayers to God. God, guide me. God, show me. God, Reveal yourself to me. God, show me what to do in this instance, in that instance. It, it creates a dependence on God when you're constantly praying to Him. Regularly come to church. Regularly come to church. It's very important. The Bible says that it's very important for believers to meet together and encourage each other, worship together. Second Peter 1, verses 5 through 10. For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue and virtue with knowledge and knowledge with self-control and self-control with steadfastness and steadfastness with godliness and godliness with brotherly affection and brotherly affection with love. For if these qualities are yours, and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he is blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election, for if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. So those things don't earn our salvation, but there are things that we can do to grow and to strengthen our faith and to strengthen our witness and our effectiveness. Jesus said this in John 6, 35 to 40. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me. And whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. He's talking about believers. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. So the verse that always comes to mind, if, you, if you're familiar with the Bible, is Jesus says, when he's talking about the last days, he says, many will come to me on the last day and say, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And, and he'll say, I never knew you. Depart from me, you 
you workers of iniquity, I never knew you. And the worry is always, well, what if that's me? What if I get to the last day? And I say, Lord. And he says, I, I don't know who you are. Well, if you're a believer, that's not you. We, we can often think, well, maybe there's a way to slip and, and slip out of salvation and I'll get to heaven and, and that'll be me and I won't get in. What does Jesus say there? He says, I never knew you. He's not talking about, uh, I'm, I'm unaware that you existed because he's God. He's omniscient. He knows everybody. What does he mean by, I never knew you? You were never mine. You weren't saved. These are people who are false teachers, people who uh, maybe they're only just about religion as opposed to salvation. He calls them workers of iniquity. Um, false teachers who are in it for, for other motives, for ill-gotten gains. It's important to know that he says, I never knew you. So if you know Jesus, he knows you. And he's not talking about you. Make sure you know him. And if you're here today and you don't know him, you can fix that today. It's, it's coming to Jesus and just saying, I have sin. I can't do anything with my sin. I, I, I accept your free gift of salvation. I want to trade my filthy rags for your robe of righteousness. I want you to be Lord of my life. You need to do that today. He'll make you a new creature, a new person, give you a new heart. And for those of you who are already believers, be encouraged. Know that you can know that even when you don't feel like it, even when you mess up, even when you feel far from God, even when you're in the valleys, He keeps you. You don't keep yourself. He keeps you in His hand. And He won't lose you. And nothing will snatch you out of His hand. Let's pray together. Dear God, we're thankful for Your Word. We need so many reminders. Because we just, we do get caught up on how we feel. And we do oftentimes feel guilty and unworthy of your love. And how could God love me? And why, why would God ever save a person like me? And I've, I've certainly, I've surely messed up for the last time. God, thank you that your word tells us that you knew all of that. You knew, you know how we are. And you knew that, and that's the very reason that, that you had to pay the price for our sin. God, help us to draw closer to you. Help us to, to have the desire to be in your word and to pray for you, uh, pray to you. God, remind us that you're the one who does the work in us, through us. God, give us a desire to be obedient to you. Thank you for saving us, Lord. Amen.